Hey everybody, thanks for joining me today for our breakout on lighting live events for video. My name is Paul Green. I've been on the team at Clark for about four years now, a little over four years now. And uh, I'm the creative director there, which means I am the lead designer for uh, of lighting and uh, a lot of the way our projects look, kind of screens and stage shapes and backdrops and uh, a lot of renderings and, and getting to work with clients to kind of figure out what their space is going to be when everything's said and done. Um, that kind of comes as a culmination of my uh, kind of career so far. I started in video broadcast uh, before all this stuff. Um, well, actually, I grew up in church, and my dad was a video producer for our church's um, small TV show that was aired on some stations around Georgia. And um, it was back in the 80s, like one-inch pneumatic tapes and um, this kind of old character generator that we could type out everybody's name on. But... Um, what I learned growing up was kind of this love for the process and how all the things are made and the you know, camera is getting cut in the switcher and how you mix for broadcast. And um, so I, I got my degree in video broadcasting in college. And um, while I was doing that, I had a job at the school as their lighting director. And the school I went to, we were doing six events a week in a basketball arena for five to 10,000 people each time. And Doing large events like that, we had iMag and large screens just because it was such a big space. So what it created was this kind of disparity between what I was able to produce in projects in class, kind of up-close camera work in a studio and up-close lighting versus what we were able to do in this big arena that didn't look great. And um, we didn't know what we were doing. We are just kind of making stuff up. Um, so it sort of started this fifth. 15 year, yeah, 15 year uh, journey for me of trying to figure out the difference between those two and how to get a good image on camera, even in large spaces. And um, still a thing for, I, it's my favorite, favorite kind of lighting is my favorite thing to study and still learning stuff every day and, you know, trying new things and trying to get better at all this stuff. So what I'm excited to share with you today is some of those things that I've found along the way. And, uh, and some of the stuff I'm still learning and trying to figure out as we go. Um, to start, I sort of want to talk about the difference between our eye and the camera. Because if, you know, if you're like me, when, when events were coming back on, on tape that looked really bad, they didn't look bad live. You know, as, as production guys, like, we're not going to put something on stage that we didn't think looked good. So why did my eye see something as fine, but the camera didn't? And by learning that, it's kind of finding that thin diagram space in the middle, that overlap, that something that looks great to both is where we can live and play as, as TV lighting directors and really make a great image that works for both places, too. Um, you know, on a, like a Sunday morning in a church environment, we can't also turn the space into a TV studio. We still have people in the room. Well, we did. We don't now. But we had people in the room in the before times. And so we have to come up with something that works for both and is a good experience to everybody. So let's start talking about, I, I kind of break the video signal down into a couple components. We've got the color side of things that we can deal with and then the brightness, exposure, contrast, intensity part of, of lighting too. So if we kind of split those two. We'll talk about color first, then we'll circle back to um, the intensity and how to balance that out. On the color side, our eyes, our eyes are super impressive. We can see, I think it's about 10 million colors. Uh, and the range of those colors is pretty broad. Um, if you look at this chart, this is called the CIE color chart. This, this was drawn up to represent all of the colors that we can see um, in the visible wavelengths. So everything inside of this horseshoe is something that we can distinguish with our eye. Um, this chart shows these three humps. These are the three types of cones in our eye. Our, our eye, our retina is made up of rods and cones. The rods kind of handle the low light. You know, when you're stumbling around in the dark trying to make your way to the bathroom and everything looks black and white, that's the rods just kind of picking up low intensity light. And they handle moonlit night type of stuff. But what we're talking about, our, our other style of vision uses our cones. There's three types, short, medium, long. They kind of, as you can see where those little bumps are, they kind of are red, green, blue sensors, sort of. Um, they're not exactly like a camera would be, but it's really similar. We, uh, side note, we have those three, we're called trimats, where we have those three styles of receptors so we can see that range of color. 
Uh, if you ever hear like bulls or dogs or they're are colorblind, they're um, dichromats. They have two styles of sensors. They see a little bit more in the blues and the yellows. They're missing some of the details in the reds and other shades that we have. So that that's why some animals are considered. They have different types of vision. We have different styles of cones. Well, but anyway, that's that's uh, some pre trivia for you there. Uh, but this span of color that we can see, we also have some other other features in our our vision that cameras don't have. So we have this giant range. We also have our brains, and our brains are interpreting the colors that our eyes are seeing into what we perceive, not just what's actually out there. By that I mean, when you see something in real life, your brain is also using your environment and your situation to explain what you're seeing. So you're not just seeing something out of context. Um, one way this works is like if I hold up a white piece of paper to you, uh, we could go, I could take you outside under daylight, I could take you inside under candlelight, and if I ask you what color that piece of paper is, without thinking, you would probably say white, unless you think I'm trying to trick you, which I sort of am. That piece of paper is white to you all the time, and your brain doesn't even bump on it. That's because we're using something called chromatic adaptation. We're kind of using our situational awareness and, and evening things out so that our our mind isn't constantly having to process that. We're just kind of taking care of it. The camera doesn't do that, and even more, the viewer of an image doesn't do that either. When you're seeing a TV show, you don't have that situational awareness to interpret what you're seeing. You now see blue paper, orange paper, orange skin, or blue skin tones when you're in different lighting environments rather than, oh, that just looks normal to me. So now our brains are bumping on things because we don't have all this extra information. So there, there's something we need to help the viewer out there with. We, we need to figure out how to be consistent with colors and not rely on our brains just kind of making up for the differences there. The other thing we need to look at is the expanse of colors we can see. Let's go back to that CIE chart. That's everything that our brains can see. But if we throw this triangle on top of this, this is what HD video can define, which is very different. That almost half of it is missing up in the greens and kind of teals and cyan down to blue. That whole bottom section with magentas and purples and violets and... All of that is outside of what we can define as video. It's kind of frustrating at first because we look at, well, if our eyes can see all these beautiful colors, why don't we record them? That doesn't make sense. So why, is, why do we have a limit? It, um, this triangle is called the gamut. Gamut is, in a color system, the total amount of colors we can define. Um, so our color system is called Rec. 709 is how we define HD video right now. Those points, if you notice, they land on red, green, and blue. Those three points of the triangle define the red, the green, and the blue that we use in RGB video. That's the exact shade that's been in Rec. 709's definition of that. The reason we have that is for consistency. I want to know that if I buy a camera, I edit some video, and then I pass it to you, that our red, green, and blue, that our colors are going to be the same. If we chose different red, greens, and blues and then tried to mix those three together, we're going to come up with very different colors when you know the director that made some video and wants to show you the movie on Blu-ray, that's going to be a whole different thing coming to you later if your TV isn't also behaving in that same triangle. So we had to kind of define something. It's not necessarily that your camera's bad. That's why you see bad colors on stage. It's that your camera has to play inside of the sandbox. Um, our LED fixtures don't. Our, even some gels that we can put on tungsten fixtures don't have to play in this. Projectors, LED walls don't have to play inside of this color space necessarily. So we can push broader colors on stage than what our cameras can define. So part of our job when we're lighting for video is to make sure that we also play inside of that space. Just because we can put a certain color on stage doesn't necessarily mean that we should or it's going to work out well. So. How does this all kind of play into real life? Um, couple, two sides of this, this color story. One is the white part of color. Um, our white balance and our white point is what we as a team, lighting and video, decide that we're gonna set our system to. Uh, this normally would be the color of your front light. It's the most neutral white 
color that you can produce on stage. So front light that I'm lighting a speaker with, or like what's lighting me right now, that's the color that I calibrated my camera to recognize as white. Because again, the camera can't just assume anything. The camera has to set things correctly. So I set this color to be white. And you look at this chart, we have a whole bunch of different colors that we can call white. Um, we call it color temperature. We use a scale called Kelvin to measure it. It's anything from really warm light on the low end, you know, to the warmest light we kind of run into is only around 2000, low 2000s candle light, all the way up to the really, really blue light that's gonna be five, 6,000, 10,000 Kelvin on the top end. So the, we're talking like daylight overcast days when it kind of seems blue, snowy days when it seems blue and really cold outside. Any of those can be defined as white. So we have to pick what we're gonna do. We can control that. We can change the color of our lighting fixtures. So why would we pick one color over the other? And what's the strategy behind that? Um, it's very situational and depends on what you need for your shoot. And there's a couple factors that I kind of think about when I'm thinking about that for deciding what I'm gonna light a stage with. This shoot in particular, this was at the Beacon Theater in New York City. We didn't have a lot of time to load this event in. Um, we actually loaded it in the morning and we shot for television that night, like an hour rehearsal and off we go. Um, so we also didn't have permission to hang anything out over the audience. They didn't have the rigging points available and we had to use their existing um, lighting system in the audience for our shoot. That system was 20, I want to say 2600 Kelvin, so very warm, very, very indoor warm candlelight kind of color. And we couldn't change it. So what we decided to do was match the rest of the system, including that LED wall that's over the stage. It's balanced down to about just under 3000 Kelvin, which is very, very warm for an LED wall. Um, front light, everything matched so that in a big wide camera shot that captures the entire room, all of it looks the same. We don't have an orange audience and a neutral stage, or we don't have a neutral audience and a really blue stage. It's all the same shade of white. But we did that by moving everything in the space down really, really warm. Basically pick the thing we can't control and bring all the things we can control to it. On the opposite end of that, here's a shoot that I did at 6,500 Kelvin. This is wide open daylight. That window behind the stage is completely open, not treated, full daylight. Um, when we circle back to talk about exposure and brightness, we'll talk about this one too, because <laughs> it's a very, very different situation. But we, again, we can't, I couldn't control the window in this circumstance. Um, we didn't have a way to put a gel or something to change the color over this, you know, I it's like 40 foot tall window. So we balanced our lighting fixtures to that so that the um, speakers in front of the window and the background behind them and the audience all match each other front to back. So again, we're neutralizing, we're bringing all those shades of white down to one so that our, because our brains no longer really have this ability watching video to make up for this change, we need to hold true to one point. At the end of the day, the so camera's balanced, that's the same white on TV. Whether we shot it at 3000, we shot it at 6500, it's the same white. Now, those are kind of extremes on either end. On a normal, if, if, if we are, have the ability to control everything in the room, if you can adjust everything going on in your space, I still pick a color temperature normally in the high 4000s, maybe 5000 Kelvin, because the majority of stuff that we use as production designers on stage are cold sources. Um, think about your stage now, you probably have some LED fixtures, you might have some moving lights that are LED based or maybe um, a discharge like a, an arc lamp of some sort that's cold. Um, there's probably some projectors, maybe an LED wall. Uh, all of those natively produce very, very cold shades of white without doing some kind of corrective work to them. The smaller system in the room that might be warm is going to be probably our front light fixtures. Um, so normally I would correct those to match what the stage is already generating. That way we don't have to warm the stage up too much. This is where the live audience plays a part because we're used to seeing screens being a little bit colder. Um, you know that feature in your phone like when it's bedtime and your phone turns orange from you know Eventually that becomes normal to you, but it takes a second. We're like, my phone is orange. And 
that same thing happens in a worship center. We can warm up all of those screens, just like your night shift on your phone. But when people walk into your room, it will be like, oh, everything looks brown. And that's, that's not necessarily what we want to do. So I don't want to warm the room up too much to where it feels really awkward. So cooling off the front light sometimes is the easier thing to do. There's no right or wrong there, but that just seems to be the easier thing um, to do. So how do we do that? A um, couple things. If your lights are already warm and you have conventional fixtures that are dimmed on a, you know, on a dimmer, they're probably warmer, you know, 27 to 3,000 Kelvin or so. Uh, lighting gel is the cheapest way to do that. A sheet of lighting gel is like six bucks. You can correct nine Legos per sheet of gel. Uh, that goes a long way. The downside is that gel that, that's going to now, a blue, you know, it's a blue color, is going to filter your light and make it colder, is going to fade over time. Because the heat and the infrared, all the stuff that's going through that gel is going to degrade it. And it's eventually going to fade back to clear. Which, so it means that your, your light's going to correct and then it's going to slowly shift back to where it was. Um, all that means is you just have some maintenance now. You kind of need to be on a regular schedule depending on how, many, how much you use your lights to make sure you change and refresh that gel so you keep that color and it doesn't you know, continually fade over time. Um, if you put that in and then three years later go back, three years later you're back to where you started. You just don't realize it. You've kind of you've, you've shifted back. Um, the next step in correcting, if you, if you use the same fixtures, is glass correction. It's more expensive. Um, it's a disc of glass that's dyed that same gel color, but it doesn't fade. But instead of $6 for nine lights, we're talking anywhere from $70 to $120 a light. Um, you see this a lot at theme parks, and, um, and, so, and a lot of times in installations we'll do this too. Um, but in theme parks that did this a lot would have fixtures everywhere, the tungsten fixtures, but they're running all day, every day, and they don't want to have to change the gels out all the time. So the designers would use lights. So if you look around at Disney, a lot of the older um, rides and experiences have glass correction everywhere. And it's for that reason. Um, we have a third option now, which didn't really exist you know, a handful of years ago. We can now just change the lighting source for our front light that still looks great on camera, but is naturally a colder color. Um, there are Lecos now, uh, some moving lights, you know, a little bit more expensive end that natively produce a great output of color, but centered at a higher color temperature. So now we don't have to correct as much, if at all, depending on what kind of fixture we use. So if you already have fixtures in your space, the most affordable, easy thing to do that you could probably do today is order some lighting gel and regel your rig and try a different color temperature. Um, it's not a lot of investment. You can rebalance your cameras and see what that looks like. If that fits really well, then maybe think about if for long term or next time you build, you know, do a new room, do a new space, you know, think about some other fixtures that may natively be that colder temperature. What you'll notice is the rest of the colors on your space start to line up and look more natural as well. So back at this um, CIE chart, if we define this point in the middle as, as a warm white, we kind of drag that triangle over with us. We kind of shift over and say, okay, we're gonna define up here now, centered on this white point, what's gonna be our colors. And we're moving away from the cold spectrum. We're pushing that outside of the limits of what our camera's gonna capture. But if we choose a colder color, we drag that triangle and recenter it over this colder section. Now we're gonna start picking up some of these you know, magentas and seeing differences in blue versus purple and magenta and teal that before just all looked blue because they were they were just smushed. You know, with color, we can think of it kind of like clipping an audio. Um, if you provide a signal louder than what the audio, whether the micro, the preamp or you know whatever the definition is can define the zeros and ones of digital audio at some point it just maxes out. And even though, you know, the drum is like producing something up here, we have maxed out the preamp and we're just, we can't describe anything more than that. We have this much dynamic range. Same thing for color channels and cameras. We have this much dynamic range of color. So if we define something past it, way out here, you know, beyond the gamut, that blue channel, say it's blue, starts to increase as we move out and say, oh yeah, we got some more blue, we got some more blue. We hit a point that we now have 100% blue in video but our lights aren't done. We're still at 80% on the light, and we still keep traveling out. 
but the camera now is maxed out and the camera pegs it blue. And what that shows up as is that weird flat, like crusty looking blue we see on video a lot. Um, that's basically color clipping. It's basically we, with the camera is seeing something beyond what it can describe in its zeros and ones and just rounds it off to the closest thing it can. It pegs the end of the system and that's all we get. So our eye can see shading of that blue because we can see all those extra colors and detail and shades. The camera can't, it sees one shade because we're done. So that's why it looks crusty and gross. So two ways to fix that. One we talked about with white balance. We can shift the system so that the camera is now playing, the camera's range of color is now playing inside of some of those frequencies. Um, you'll never get it completely. There will always be a color some LED fixture will create that a camera can't describe, but you'll get more of it in there. So after that, now we need to be conscious of that. Watch a monitor when you're at the lighting desk. Um, I actually am typically watching the monitor a little bit more than I'm watching this stage, especially when something is primarily for broadcast, um, to make sure that if it looks great on the monitor, it's probably gonna look fine live. So I'm watching for those colors. The way to handle that, if you see a weird color that looks strange on camera, is desaturate it or take the intensity down. One of those two. If you just bring the intensity back, that means the levels aren't as high and that color channel's not gonna clip. You're gonna bring that back into range. Or if you bring the, the saturation down, take that little bit of a paler blue or maybe a little bit more of a blue green than a blue purple, now we're getting into the range that camera can define again and it's gonna look a little bit better. But watch your monitors, really, and just grab those fixtures that are that and turn them down a little bit or something. You, you don't, don't have to crush, especially on people's faces. Um, can just be really distracting from what's going on and isn't really helping anybody out. All right, so we talked about color. We talked about centering our white balance point on a common point so the whole stage, everything together looks the same. Uh, we talked about saturation, which is making sure our colors stay inside of our sandbox, our, our gamut of Rec. 709. Uh, now let's talk a bit about brightness, exposure, light levels. How bright should the stage be? How dark should the stage be? Uh, how do we how do we balance things out so things look interesting, not too flat, but things aren't blowing out and just look kind of crazy on camera? Uh, again, going back to our eyes, I, our eyes we can perceive about a I think it's a billion different levels of light. You can walk out and see detail in starlight. You can also see a lot of detail under bright sunlight, and we're fine. Um, all right, really, our eye only sees about a thousand different levels of light but we're shifting. We're shifting along the scales. Our eyes actually adjust. We're shifting between using our rods, using our cones, our brain is adapting, and our brain is remembering all the detail we picked up as our eyes adjust, so we've composited this giant view of the world where we remember all these details. Again, camera doesn't do any of that stuff. Um, depending on your camera, uh, you know, it can be anywhere from eight, nine, we call it stops of light, to 13 to 14 on the higher end with some cameras. Um, in video, we, we talk about lighting brightness in terms of stops. Um, a stop of light is a doubling of light. So um, say if I'm metering with a light meter, if I pick up 50 foot candles, and then I move over and pick up 100 foot candles, that is a stop difference of light. On the camera, that translates to the F stops on your iris ring. Um, whole stops are numbers like to f2, 2.8, 4, 8, and as we move through those, we have halved the amount of light that's going in the camera, and we've you know doubled the amount of light that's going in the camera as we open back up. So with a camera, just like with white balancing, once we set exposure on the video side, hopefully a face is exposed about the same, you know, like 50 to 70%, you know, from zero to 100%, zero is dark, and 100% is, is white, his face is going to be somewhere around 50 to 70 percent, somewhere in that range. If that face was lit with a million foot candles or two foot candles, we typically want that face to be exposed about the same on stage, unless we're going for an effect and we want it to feel dark or feel bright. So that is calibrating the camera to match how much light we have on stage. Again, as lighting directors, we get to pick. I get to choose how much light I'm going to throw on the stage, and the camera guy kind of has to set their camera to make that work. So how do we pick that? And how do we know what's gonna work well for an event? Um, there's a couple different things to balance 
And again, it's usually a good team decision. Talk to whoever is producing video, if it's actually a video producer or if you have a director, um, anyone who's responsible for producing a video, it might even be you. The factors they're gonna think about are camera factors. Um, optically, the camera lens, how you, your iris is set, affects a few things. Uh, one is depth of field. Uh, if you notice, I'm using, so I'm using a DSLR to record this right now. Um, so this camera has a larger sensor. Um, and I'm shooting, I think it's shooting about f4, which means I have a shallower depth of field for this camera. Um, that is all of this stuff behind me, how blurry this fake IKEA plant thing looks and this fake target succulent and this Chemex thing over here, how blurry that is compared to me, I can control. I actually could set this camera so that we're both in focus all the time, but that doesn't really look pleasing. Actually, it looks nice to have me really sharp and the background kind of blurry. Um, the way that changes is the tighter the iris, which is the higher the number, so like F8, F11, F22, the tighter the iris, the deeper the depth of field is on the camera. The other factor is how far in you're zoomed on the camera. Also, both of those things, your iris and your, your focal length, your zoom length on your camera brings your depth of field together. A shallow depth of field means the range that is in focus is shallow. So think of it from the camera to me. If you watch my hand, I'm moving out of depth of field and then I'm moving back in. The depth of field is not very much because I'm actually going out of focus pretty fast. And behind as well, it's getting out of focus pretty quick. So, I mean, we're talking like this. That works great for me sitting here pretty still. And this camera is actually auto-focusing. It's, it's doing a pretty good job. Good job, Canon, R, whatever this is. Um, on a Sunday, and this camera also is ooh, five feet from me, very, very close. This doesn't translate super well to a large venue. In your space, as a lot of spaces that, that I'm lighting, the cameras are 50, 60 feet, if not 100, 120 feet sometimes, way far away. So depth of field. You know, I mentioned the zoom of the camera plays into that. So if we want to get this shot from 100 feet away, we are using a very long lens, so very shallow depth of field. If we also open the iris of the camera up as well, super wide, we've really collapsed the depth of field where you can get it to where someone's eye is in focus and their ear is out of focus. That is really, really tricky for a camera operator because as someone is moving around stage and walking and you know taking a 40 foot stage walk around, they've got to track focus with them now. So as a lighting director, a, an unsharp, blurry video doesn't look good to anybody. I'm not helping anybody by creating this situation that's like that. So I do want to give enough light on stage that the camera can be exposed at a normal, honestly, I love around F, F3, 8 to F4 on the camera. Um, opening up to 2, 8, really, really, really wide from a very, very long distance is really tricky. Also, cheaper camera lenses don't look as good when you open them up super wide. That's part of what you're paying for with a really expensive camera lens is the ability to open it up super fast, really wide aperture, but maintain sharpness. That's hard to do with camera lenses. So if you just have standard lenses that came with your cameras and you try to open them all the way up, they'll probably do it, but they, the whole image will be sharp. What's in focus won't actually be tack focus. Um, DSLRs actually do this better to be honest, photography lenses are better at doing this, but you'll even notice with those how much more expensive a lens that can go down to f2, f1.8, f1.2 are than the standard kit lens that came with the camera. It's because the ability to get the glass and the optics to line up just right to make that work is more expensive. So all that is a factoring in. I don't wanna create a situation where the camera guy has to micro adjust focus every time a speaker moves forward and back because the, the plane of focus is so tiny. Um, that's hard for a professional cameraman, but we're working with volunteers in a church environment. It's way harder. So I don't want to set them up for failure. I do want to give them a little some space. I do want the background blurry. I don't want it completely in focus, but I, I want to give them some space. Um, so typical video cameras, and this changes, but typical video cameras to expose at about an F4 or a little under that, is gonna be about 40 to 50 foot candles on stage. 
And the way I measure that is with a light meter. Um, mine, I use a one by a company called Sekonic. Um, there's a couple other companies out there that do a great job. And it's as simple as just taking a quick reading and I can see 50 foot candles on stage. Um, I, I kind of want to maintain that and I want to maintain throughout the, the event that every person, I, that's my center point, just like our white balance, that's our center point. Every person that needs to look neutral, not for an effect for dark or brighter, but a neutral person, a speaker and a singer for most of the time will be lit with our white color that we picked and at that exposure that we picked. So I don't drop the light level for worship on faces. I'll do other things to make worship look more contrasty. I'll make the background darker. I'll maybe light them from a little bit different angle, but the same intensity. So the camera guy's not having to open wide up because we're really dark for worship, but then all of a sudden it's somebody's praying and all the lights come up and we have to turn the cameras down. I want to maintain consistency for video. I can theatrically change how that looks and feels, but I'm actually maintaining that same light level on people the whole time. Um, if you can do that as a lighting director, your camera guys will love you for it. The shader, I, I, it's, it's the best feeling when the shader or, you know, the video operators controlling the cameras comes, finds you after the thing and will tell you how, you know, like it was so consistent. Like that is the best compliment in, in video that you can get. Um, so that's a goal. I want to pick an exposure on stage that helps the camera guys do their job, um, creating, you know, easy focus. I want to create something that's easy to see in the room. Um, you know, older eyes in the back of the room. If my grandma came to an event to see something from the back of the room, if it's really, really dark on stage, it actually is harder for older people to, you know, keep that in focus. Um, so you know, that's a decent light level for people to watch. It's also a decent light level to balance with the other elements on your stage. We now have LED walls that can be as bright as the sun and, we we really don't want, I want white on the LED wall to be just like if somebody held up a white piece of paper on stage. I don't want it to be four times brighter than that. Again, our eyes can handle it in the room. Our eyes can handle it. Our brains can compensate for it. We're fine. If we look at the LED wall that's really bright, we'll adjust real quick and we can see it. If we look back at the stage that's somebody that's barely lit, we can still make it out. The camera doesn't have that ability at all. Again, we're talking about systems that we play with data. So we have dark to white. Beyond that is nothing and below that is nothing. So what we have to understand with the camera is that that amount of brightness change is what we can play with in lighting too. Because as soon as we go beyond that, just like with color, the camera can't define it anymore. And that's when things just look crushed. And so if you have a, a video screen behind somebody and you, know, you throw up a big graphic and the whole thing is just a solid white color or something, and there's no detail, it's because it's living up here. There is detail, but it's beyond the camera and the camera can't record that detail. It's done. So we have to make sure that our white brightness is also pretty much the same. Um, there's different ways to measure that. I measure that with a spot meter. Um, my, my intensity meter does both. I have a, um, it's called an incident meter that I use for light falling on it, which is what I'll walk the stage with. But I have a spot or reflective meter that I can point at a screen and be able to tell you how bright the light coming off that screen is. That's what the camera's seeing. There's no light falling on a LED wall. There's only light coming out of it. So I use a reflective meter to see that light coming back. Um, and I want that white to match what white would probably be on you know, white sheet of paper or the white on a camera chart that we'll balance to. That way we're all playing in that same space. Live, this actually does look a little bit dark. It does look like screens are a little underpowered for a minute. You eventually get used to it, but if you first turn on a screen at full power and everyone gets really happy about it, and then you have to go ask everybody, hey, can we knock that down to like 10% of what that is? people do notice and people will ask about it. And a lot of the graphics playback guys on events will actually ask like, hey, this doesn't feel right to me when I put a graphic up, but we'll have to go back and look at the camera and look at the monitor and show people that like, this graphic you see on your computer screen now looks the same coming back on video. So what you're producing and what's in your head is what the viewer is gonna see. But live, it feels darker to you because we, you know, it's just, that's just the way it has to balance out for camera. So 
matching that intensity everywhere is kind of a big deal. And again, finding something that works for everybody. So for me, it's anywhere from 40 to 50 foot candles typically. Again, extreme cases, sometimes you have to adapt. Um, back to that Beacon Theater show, their audience lighting it was, oh, I don't remember how dark it was, but it was pretty dark. And we didn't want that. We wanted to see the audience. This particular broadcast wanted to do the close-up audience shots of people. So I didn't want the audience to look like they were a black hole compared to the stage. So we brought the stage intensity way down. So the stage is, I think, lit at 26 foot candles for this shoot. Really dark. Um, we discussed it ahead of time and talked to the you know, camera operators, talked to the video producers, made sure everybody's cool, and we all knew what we were getting into when we did it and why we were doing it. And it worked great. On the opposite end of the spectrum, back to this room with a glass window, that is literally 1,000 foot candles on stage. Um, the video producer didn't want to treat that window. They wanted to be as clear as possible, so the skyline was sharp. So we had to basically treat it like an outdoor shoot. It's 6,500 Kelvin, which is cold. There's 1,000 foot candles. It's like 950 foot candles of light on the stage. And but when it's balanced, and these are, actually, these are camera shots. These aren't photographs. These are from stills from camera. Uh, it looks like it just fits in the scene, and you don't really realize that is a ton of light on that stage. So balance is key over the actual brightness. Balance is what makes that video signal look great. So if we hadn't balanced that, if I lit that stage of 50-foot candles, the we're talking about stops being a doubling of light. You'd have to so 50 would be. You know, 100, 200, 400, 800, five, you know, we're talking like five stops, six stops or something, way over just to just begin to get that background in. So the whole background would just be white and blown out nothing. Um, but in a dark room, if I lit that stage at 50 foot candles, the audience is now two to three times darker than the stage and a wide shot of the room would look like a black hole, which in this case wasn't what they wanted. So we had to kind of bring the stage down to match. So it's, it's a balance and based on your situation. So um, with both of these things, the biggest takeaway, I think, for lighting for camera is realizing that y you've got a bunch of different elements that you can control. I've got front light. I've got backlight. I've got video displays on stage. All of these different things, the more that you can consolidate to a single point, bring your color temperatures together, bring your brightness together, then the, the less work the camera has to do to capture it, and the more natural everything's going to feel. Um, somebody wearing a white shirt next to a screen with a white graphic, if those are really the same shade of white on stage, then the camera will see it that way too, and everything looks great. Not a blue screen behind somebody with a white shirt, or an orange shirt in front of a white screen. Um, so those are some of the biggest takeaways, I think, for balancing your stage to look great on camera in a live event. And some of those decisions you have to make ahead of time. All right, I kind of want to play around with this a little bit on camera here to show you what I'm, what I'm talking about with some of these things. Um, we don't really have a stage or you know, a room we can go to right now to, to look at it, but I can show you kind of my setup in this room. It's pretty simple, but I can change some of these components, rebalance the camera and show you the difference of what things look like when they're out of balance so we can kind of bring it back in and make it work. Um, so I'm using, there is a production light in it. Well, production light. I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. It's a homemade soft light. It's a two foot by four foot piece of cardboard with some LED tape. Um, it's actually LED tape made for broadcast television. I normally use it as um, a strip light across the front edge of a stage for just a tiny bit of up light. But I've kind of spiraled it around this board to create a larger soft light. That's that's what I, I have a shadow on my face, but it's pretty soft because that light is big. It's something we can take advantage of in a small environment. We can't really do that in a large room, but I can change the intensity of that. I can also change the color temperature of that. So by changing that to balance the rest of the room is how we're getting this look. The rest of the room is pretty much 2700 Kelvin. Um, these two lamps behind me there's some track lighting straight up above me, and there's a couple little fixtures here. They're all about 2,700. A um, little bit of daylight coming in from some windows, but they're pretty much closed. There is one studio light right here. See that shadow on the side of my face? This highlight is coming from one fixture. Um, it is a tiny bit colder than the front light, not by much, but just a little bit. And um, 
in single camera style shooting, like if you're doing, you know, just one off videos, that's really called a kicker if you throw a light off to the side like that. On stage, it would normally be a backlight. It would come from about 45 degrees up above me, behind me, and light my shoulders and the top of my hair. If you can see on, on this side of my face, it's a lot easier for my hair to kind of fall back into this background that's about the same color. This highlight light is really bringing out some details and highlights that separate my hair from the background. That's where this kind of edge is coming from that's on me here. Um, same with a little bit of edge that's here on my shirt. So that would be backlighting on a stage setup. Right now it's just this kind of kicker that's over here on the side. So this front light is set about 2700. Let me go play with it and see if I can, I can take it to about half. There we go. So it's now not only brighter because it has two sets of LEDs in it. This is 4,000 Kelvin. 42, if I remember right. I can go meter it, but I think the last time I used it, it has a warm and cold LED when they're both on, it's at 42. The background, for the most part, is exposed the same. This cabinet is getting some of the light of this front light, so it's a little bit brighter too. But obviously, I am now way overexposed. So to fix that, I now have to take the camera value down. To expose myself roughly the same. Let's see, maybe one more click up. I'm doing this without a meter and without a monitor. I'm looking at my computer. So if I bring my face eh, about where we were, so I'm definitely colder, I look kind of pale. That's because this camera is still balanced to 2700. These lights in the back, their color looks the same, but they look really dark. So you can see how we've now kind of separated the scene. My front light is really, oh, microphone. My front light is really cold, but also too bright. So this background is way too dark. And if we rebalance the white balance to my face, um, you'll see how, how different that looks. Let me rebalance this camera to me, and then we'll take a look at the background. Okay, I'm back. So I rebalanced the camera. I'm, I'm doing this very cheaply. I took a white sheet of paper, and with this DSLR, actually you take a photo of it, and then it calibrates itself, it balances out, and makes this white. So I'm now under 4,200 degrees, front light. So my skin should look about the same as what you were seeing before. Some of the extra light that's hitting me from the background is a little bit warmer. So you notice like some, some of the stuff on my shoulder and my hair is a little bit warmer than it was. But for sure this backdrop is. The top of the counter, these two lights that are behind me are really, really golden. Um, but also the light level is lower because we brought this light level up. Now we're out of balance. My skin, I kind of, I just manually dialed this in. I don't have a, any scopes or anything with me here. But my skin tone is now back to where we were. But to do that, I had to drop the camera level down a little bit, which dropped the backdrop because it didn't change. So again, that's where that balance comes in. If we're too bright up here, the backdrop changes from that. If we're too cold compared to the backdrop. Now it's too warm. Um, I could go even colder with this. I could take this front light to... Uh, I think it's 6,000 if we go full, let me see, take all these out to take, there we go. So this is another, another level of blue higher than we were. Um, so if I balance to this, then you'll see what a full blue difference looks like. Okay, so third change for the light. This is now running in about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. Our intensity has dropped back. If you can tell, the backdrop isn't as dark as it was. It, because this light, the only controls I have for this light are some switches. I don't have a lighting console with me or anything. Um, but it works with a set of warm LEDs and cold LEDs. And by it varying how much and mixing the two, I can pick which color temperature we're at. So at first we were warm, just the warm only. Then we were halfway, about 4,200 Kelvin. That's both of these color, both of the sets of LEDs together. But it also brought the intensity up because it's double the LEDs. That's why the background was so dark last time. Our intensity is back to normal because we dropped the warm LEDs. We're you know, just cold. But if you can tell, the camera is balanced so that this color from the front light should look neutral and white but it's pushed the background to be really, really warm. It's no longer neutral white anymore. 
Um, those two lamps on either side of me are really golden. This fridge over here is like kind of a golden color on the front. Um, this countertop, that kind of paint color of the wall right there should be neutral. That's a gray. Um, so everything's really, really off. You can even see it on me because some of the scene, the lights from the scene are, are hitting me. So this kicker light that's over here on the side is now a golden color rather than a crisp white color. Um, so it's a little example of how this balance really is important and picking this color temperature um, really does matter because I wanna blend in with the rest of the scene. I want the camera to see one thing. If you're here in person, honestly, like it does look colder over here and it does look warmer back there, but not near as much as what I'm seeing when I look at the monitor and how golden and, and rich that is. The camera kind of exaggerates it and my brain doesn't have the ability to differentiate between it anymore, to really make an exception for it. It just looks wrong. So the way to fix it is just to bring all these colors back together and to make sure our intensities match where I am a little bit brighter than the background but not so much that the background is just gone and dark. Okay, so we're back in the balance. The front light's back to 2700 Kelvin. Our intensity's back down to something pretty usable. Um, this is the same thing that's true on your stage in any room that you're working in. If the opposite would happen if Instead of these warm sources back here, if they had been projection screens, LED walls, maybe that, that teaching screen that rolls out for the pastor, uh, moving lights, any of those cold sources, we'd see the opposite effect. If I used a warm fixture to light me and balance the camera to that so that I'm you know, the neutral white color, all of that's gonna be pushed blue. Just like we saw the background go warm a minute ago, the opposite would happen. But if I light myself with the same color of light, and the camera balances to that, then all those colors look fine too. So white on the screen is now the same white that's on me. And so when we're watching that back on video later, it all kind of works together and feels great. So those are really the two main components that I'm trying to keep in mind as I light a stage. And um, it's something that you could try next too is think through your color. Pick a white balance point that really matches as many things together as you can and practically have control of. Uh, on your stage. And sometimes that's as easy as just going by and trying, trying some lighting gel on your front light. Re-white re balance the cameras. That's hard to say. Re-white balance the cameras once you've re-gelled your lights and see what your stage looks like. See if you like it. Then also pick an intensity that works well for your cameras. Um, for me, that's normally 40 to 50 foot candles. Uh, I don't want to be too dark that uh, I don't want the background to end up being too bright. You know, LED walls sometimes are really hard to turn down really low. Uh, sometimes they don't have control over projection screens. They just are where they are, and um, depending on the situation. So sometimes I'll have to meet those with a brighter intensity. I also don't want to create a bad circumstance for the camera operator. I want to give them a little bit wider depth of field, not so much that everything's in focus, but enough that they can feel comfortable running the camera from a long distance away from someone who's moving on stage and trying to track a person. Um, so blending all these things together, try something out. You know, reach out, let us know what you, let us know what you find. Um, I know there's, some, there's a comment section going to you. So let us know what you find, let us know what you've tried and what works for you and what doesn't. And um, so we all kind of figure this thing out together. Hope you guys have a great day, stay safe out there and uh, talk to you soon.